all. This is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So once again, today with us, we have our own end bean, Paul Burke. He is an end bean because he's praying, hoping and working to see if the COVID pandemic is finishing. And I think it is finishing. So Paul, welcome. What do you think? Is it finishing? Thank you. It certainly looks like it is, but uh, we've been surprised before and uh, I certainly can be surprised again. Got it. So what would you like? Would you like me to share? Yep, we'll share it. We'll just go ahead and get started. We have a fair amount to cover here. And Let's let me go. know if there's any questions. We had some questions about patent law and as a licensed patent lawyer, I thought I could answer some of the questions and perhaps help people understand a little more about what goes on. So this Absolutely. Is, do you want to do that now or later? Yeah, I can do it now. I have the, the part of the presentation should be up. Yeah. So the, the, the Constitution says that Congress has the right to uh, preserve for inventors and for authors the rights to their perspective uh, creations. So that means the, the patent law and the copyright law. They don't have a requirement, but they have a, an ability to do that, an express grant, and we've always had a patent law. And the idea of the patent law is that somebody has to share their what they the best way they know to practice the invention, get it published so everyone can start building on it. In exchange for that, the US government will let the courts enforce and stop people from practicing the invention where if they kept it secret they would not have anyone else practicing their invention so they're swapping disclosing it for a legal enforcement and as you see here whoever invents or discovers so it has to be the inventor or discoverer it has to be a new and useful process so if it's not novel you can't get a patent Useful means that uh, certain things like copyrights that are novel ways of expressing an idea are not patentable, but simply it has to be useful for something. It has to have some utility. A process, a machine, a manufacturer, a composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement of that. And this is what we're talking about with, uh, with uh, Dr. Patterson. The drug was already patented. Someone has already done it. He's found a new use for it, a use for it in a particular type of treatment. Now, he has a claim, and he may say, I claim it to be used in dealing with COVID. And even if he didn't know it, if someone had had a description before about using that drug for COVID, it would invalidate a claim that included something that was not novel. And that could happen later on. You've heard of patent infringement suits, and then the defense tries to prove the patent invalid. That's the sort of thing that occurs. And patent suits are always dealing with a lot of money, and the average attorney's fees are over a million dollars for, for a patent litigation. And so it becomes some of the most intense uh, litigation, and they start looking at things uh, in a way that most of us never have had scrutiny. Um, I remember one case where a patent was held invalid because the ink that was used in the data book, they analyzed it and the pen that had written the information wasn't sold until after the dates that were written down. And so, you know, that's a pretty excruciating level of, of investigation. So, but again, it has to be new and useful and it's up to the parties litigating to see. And, if you have a patent, it has a limited life, and it's subject to the conditions and requirements of the law here, okay? And typically what happens is it takes a while for a patent, a, a patent thing to become um, large in the market, and usually about the time it really becomes large, the patent runs out. And so it is a good trade for someone to disclose it, and they have to not just disclose the invention, but they have to teach the best way they know to practice it as part of their application and if they can if someone can show they didn't teach the best way they know the patent will be invalid because that's part of the exchange they say not only do you have to tell the world about it you have to explain to them the best way you know to practice it that's a very interesting one so i have a question then does this mean that dr patterson's um, patent he he has this responsibility to teach us how to use it in within that context of his pet patent 
Yes, as of the time he applied for the patent, it has to be the best way he knows. And sometimes I, I, people may say, look, I'm not going to run that experiment to figure it out until after I've applied. But mm -hmm. one of the dangers is, and we've had this, where someone, um, you have a mixture of two compounds. Well, it can't go from zero to 100 because zero of it doesn't have your invention, right? And so you pick a zone. And there was someone that picked a zone from 20 to 80%. Well, then when they did the market research, it turned out that the most profitable place to run it was actually outside the zone they claimed. So thank you for telling me about it. You claiming from 20 to 80% and 19% is the, is the cheapest way to make it. So thank you very much. Off we go. We won't infringe your patent. We'll run it right below at 19%. And so again, there's risks if someone wants to play games with that. Got it. So one last question, and then um, so these are just my curiosities, not for Peterson's uh, patent, but generally. So let's say Dr. Bruce Peterson comes up with this new patent, new useful way of using Miraviroc. Uh, there are There is Miraviroc in use for other reasons, HIV, for example. Can they now both kind of users stop each other from using it because they have patents good, good good question but right before i answer it let me first say i'm not giving legal advice to anybody here and just like mm -hmm. you have your medical disclaimer i need a legal yeah. disclaimer and there is no right. medical advice here as well right and let's not talk about dr patterson directly let's talk about someone like him let's call him dr mm -hmm. k okay mm -hmm. so we have mm -hmm. a, a dr k has a drug that is patented and he finds a new use for it let's say it cures cancer and he's using mm. aspirin. Aspirin's been around for a long time. He can't mm. stop people from using aspirin. And so mm. if someone says, well, I'm just taking aspirin for my uh, fever reduction and it just inadvertently cures the cancer. Mm. You know, can you stop someone from prescribing aspirin for fever re reduction? And your, your cancer patients come in and say, I think I have a bit of a fever. Can I get some of that aspirin? Again, mm. aspirin's a silly example because it doesn't need a prescription, but something like that they could do. If it still is under patent, what happens is if we go to the, I think, uh, no, it's talking about a patent gives you the right to stop someone from practicing the invention. Okay. So if Dr. Pa if Dr. K had a patent, on, a patent on the use of aspirin for cancer relief, he could theoretically stop people from doing that. The person that has the general patent on aspirin can stop him and everyone else from using aspirin unless they license it. And yeah. you can have so four or five are... of these patents all built up. And to do something, you might have to go do that. Think, for example, an automobile. How many different patentable things could be in a given car? You know, you could have a hundred, a thousand, right? Yeah. And if you didn't yeah, get a license think... from every one of them, arguably your production could be shut down. Got it. Thing is, so one last question. Sorry. In a patent suit for damages, they give you three times the damages you can prove, which includes either the profit you lost, the profit the other guy got, or the entire sales price the other person got. Mm, very interesting. This so, this is interesting. Plus, you get your attorney's fees, which are roughly for a, a patent litigation is roughly a million dollars. And part of the answer that people say, can I get a cheap patent? Yes, but it's not worth anything in terms of enforcing it. Because if you haven't mm. done a phenomenal search and haven't prepared it for that kind of assault, it's not going to work very well. Got and it. So most small businesses that have a patent are just sort of waiving it. They're not planning on litigating it. They just want someone to back away because, you know, this could be a real hassle and whatever with it. Got it. Got thing it. Is so, you may have seen the words patent pending that people put on yes. something. Well, the US yeah. Supreme Court has said patent pending is simply a representation that you don't have a current patent. <laughs> that is actually an announcement that I don't have it. Got it. Right. Uh, so one quick question and then we move from, from the patent side, if you like. Uh, Alexander said, could Dr. Bean patent Luffy for use in COVID? Well, was he the person that discovered it? Uh, no. No. You're not the Somebody inventor. Else. No, you can't. Has it already been disclosed mm. to the public? Yes. Yes. In fact, we can prove that it's been disclosed to the public and has been 
you know, then so it, you, you're it, if you've already told it to the public or someone else invented it, you can't get it. This has to be early on and sort of an exchange that you're keeping it secret and you're trading your secret for the federal courts enforcing it. And so if it's not secret up to that point, they won't trade it. It, it has to be something that you've kept confidential. Got now, it. it. Got it. Thank you very much. Right. And, and, and it is published. So some PhD thesis is a master's thesis is are published and there have been patents that have held invalid where someone has gone into Budapest and gone onto a, a, a college campus and found a published master's thesis that included the work and no one could find it because it wasn't indexed. Well, so if the doctors themselves had discussed, let's say on my show or somebody else's show before the whole patent thing, does that actually risk the patent itself then because yeah. they talked about it before? If someone is not an inventor and if they don't have a legal obligation to keep it quiet, a non-disclosure agreement, then they have disclosed it. Now, mm -hmm. if you have a legal non-disclosure and they still disclose it, that doesn't cause a trouble. But if you just go and tell somebody, oh, I went and told my wife and she told the hairdresser. Oh, too bad. Got it. So you have a client here. Skyfrog says, I have something that needs to be patented. Can you help me, Paul? No, I'm not practicing patent law. Okay. If you want to All talk right. in general about what patent law means to help guide you to go hire someone to legally represent you, that's something that I could do. But I will not, I, I can't represent you. I, I represented a big company for a long time and you know, I'm not in the, the position to do that right now. Uh, so no. Got it. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, to the listeners, uh, there is no legal advice. There is no medical advice. These are just informational discussions that we are doing. Cool. So, Paul, we have Zoe data here. Right. Now, this is a Zoe. Zoe just came out today, okay, with the new update. So this is the one from the week before. I will give you the one that they had, um, they just came out with. But not right now. I'm looking just at the one that they, um, from a week ago, okay? And you can look at the rate that it's coming up here, okay? See that the, the, this line, double line, is the rate that the new uh, symptomatic cases are being found here, okay? And the symptomatic cases, if we look at this slope, this is the same slope put on the prior and the prior and the, and the bump before that, the peaks. So you can see the rate of increase is steeper than it was at the beginning, the first Omicron wave. This is much steeper curve that they have, right? And this is the decrease that they have. And you can see the decrease they had after the first Omicron is, and I just slid them over. So these have, have exactly the same slope. So the decrease is the same as what they had after the first Omicron. And the second Omicron uh, wave came up much slower and went down much slower. Very interesting. And we have a 10% decrease in the week to week. And uh, uh, they have an R reported of 0 0.9 is what uh, Professor Speck uh, said in the uh, Zoe app update. And he said That's actually a good thing. R of lesser than one is useful. Right, it says it's decreasing. And it's the highest rate the UK ever had for peak, and it's not even down to the prior highest peak. They had 250,300 new daily new cases estimated from there. So one in 15 people is currently ill. Down, and, it, 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 it's, and one in 19, I think is the current, and it was one in 15 the week before. Got it. But if we look today, this is the one they had today. They're still reporting an R of 0 0.9 and 227,000 cases rather than the 250,000, which is only a little less. But I blew up the, the peak coming down here. And if you take a look, if this was the rate of decrease, it's flattening out already. It's slowing down. We have, a, we have an inflection point right after the peak. Something's happening to stop the, the decrease of the um, of COVID in 
the UK. And if we take a look at the prior peaks, they were consistent coming down. We didn't get the inflection point until way down. And so one of the questions is if the inflection point is right here, is it gonna start coming up again like it did twice before? I have no idea. I don't That's think anybody true. knows. But it's not good. And you can see the dots are getting closer and closer together, which is showing you since they're spaced horizontally the same place that the rate of decrease is coming down as the dots get closer together and as they get farther apart the rate of increase or decreases and you can see right here we have an inflection point much much higher than we had before here we have another inflection point it's coming down a little bit but it's you know is, is it coming back parallel i think it's still drifting away from the line a bit so uh, the decrease in a uh, infection rate depends upon the immunity in the system and the tools that we have to protect ourselves and to kill the virus and so on. So here, is there something inherent in the virus itself or it is the society's behavior and the virus contributing to this? Well, I don't think they've had a shift in the virus itself. It might be that we're getting the, the BA212 coming into the UK, and that may be why it's coming up a bit. But it may also be the behavior. I mean, the, the first level of defense, uh, uh, you know, the first, from my perspective, not medical books, the first level of immune defense is your brain and having you not go someplace where you're putting yourself at risk or not making a decision to, I know you'll hate this, to, to lick a pencil. Man, yes, I did lick the pencil, so I would keep coming clean about that. <laughs> no pun intended. Got it. <laughs> right. And so, again, this is not tremendously large, but it's significant that it's showing up in the Zoe reported data. And, and we didn't see that in the prior ways, and we did, certainly didn't see that on the way up. You can see that, it, it, that there's no inflection, and here we have two inflection points. And my bet is someday in the far distant future, someone will do a, a paper and have an explanation as to what actually happened someplace. Now, this slide gets a little bit uh, busy, but if we take a look at the, the blue, which is the zero to 17, this is the breakdown from the Zoe app, and you look at the rate of decrease that we had in the prior way for the zero 17, and then we slide it over here you can see again that we've got this coming up, coming back down, coming up again. We're much, much above where it should have been if it decreased at the same rate that it decreased at the end of the last peak. And this is a zero to 17. If we look at the orange, uh, see the orange are the, let's see, let's see which one is which. So, and then, then let's take a look at the greens. The greens are the parents of the zero to 17, right? And you can see they're much higher than the decrease that they had initially. So we're seeing the, the mm -hmm. zero to 17s and the 35s to 54s being higher. And with the 35 to 54s being much higher than the zero to 17s in terms of the rate of decrease. It is decreasing, but it's not decreasing as fast as it did before. We go back to the prior wave, you can see that it was fairly consistent coming down in the 35 to 54s, and particularly in the 0 to 17s. Not, it didn't come down as, as far, but it wasn't as high. And here we're getting it increasing. If we look at the uh, uh, 75s and over, they're consistently coming down. Hmm. And we look at the uh, 18 to 34s, they appear to be fairly consistent coming down. We have different rates of decrease for them all. And then the red, uh, this one is, seems to be coming down fairly consistent. It came up a little, but it's coming back down. And so we have the Got biggest it. discrepancy in the 0 to 17 and the 35 to 54s. So these mm. two people, these two group cohorts seem to be driving the increase that we're seeing in the UK. Got it. And, and we're talking I... about the UK so much, not so much that I mean, we care about them, but not that we care more than other places, but we just have better data from them than we have. The UK US. has always had good data for us. Uh, Israel as well. So a yeah. uh, quick comment from John Snyder. I'm, I'm more worried about adenovirus at this moment, especially adenovirus 42, airborne hepatitis for everyone. 
So I think it's not going to be for everyone, John Snyder, but for a mu naive, for, for example, younger children. But who knows? You may be right. Okay. So back to you, Paul. Now, the Nazoli app, uh, the professor was saying that he's showing great correlation between the ONS study, which are these yellow lines, and the pink line, which is his study, and the REACT-1, where they took samples that just periodically showed. And he's saying they, they have good correlation, but if you take a look, the ONS is total cases. They were much higher here, you know, you know, 70% higher. Here they were 20% higher. Here they're not so much. So the correlation between the two is decreasing significantly. And the question is, are they having fewer and fewer asymptomatic cases? In order for this to come down, the ONS it goes and samples people. And, and so they should have a complete sampling of folks that are, that are responding to their um, analysis of whether they're infected or not. And the Zoe is people reporting their apps. And so I would have expected this difference to get larger rather than smaller. So while there is still a pretty good correlation and we still have that the ONS, the ONS looks like it is preceding the Zoe app. You know, it goes up first. Mm -hmm. And I would have thought the ONS data would have been later than the Zoe. So again, there is fairly good correlation. I don't want to take anything away from it, but there still seems to be some question in my mind and the correlation seems to be decreasing in terms of mm -hmm. the peak. The amount of lag time seems roughly the same. Interesting. Thank you for sharing this. And I also have a question from M. Gregory. Uh, M. Gregory says, question, at this point, why hasn't certain people's immune systems adapted to the virus and variants? Well, the UK is showing 99% of people that, the, that they're looking at the blood sampling have active antibodies right now. And some of the people, um, uh, Dr. Campbell is uh, suggesting that the fact that Omicron is around so much is saying everyone's getting exposed and they don't need a booster because they're getting boosted every time they go outside. And so your question is a very good question. Why, why are we still seeing this? So actually know. what would happen is that um, as much as our immune systems need to become familiar with the virus, the virus is also adapting continuously towards us as well. This is where I believe that there is a huge difference in the doomsayers who used to say, as the vaccines are given or as the the world progresses in the manner we were, uh, we will have more and more uh, dangerous viruses and they would cause damage and they would cause... Actually, you are seeing the virus itself, even if it becomes transmissible more, it continues to become more and more adapted to us. Just like that, our immune system is continuing to become more and more familiar. I think that I have now gotten exposed twice. The first time I got exposed, remember four or five days later, I realized it was, and Rima said to do the test, I did the test, I was positive. Then it continued for 10, 14 days for me. This time when I got exposed about a week ago, I did have this cough that developed, week or two weeks ago, cough that developed, but otherwise I just could not, actually there was not much. So my body is now adapting to it or becoming more familiar with it. And the virus is also becoming more friendly towards us. So I think this process would continue for some more time till it would become a human coronavirus. It does not have any other way to go. And unfortunately in this process, of course, there is a lot of death and damage that has occurred and still occurring. Right. And, and, as some of you may know, I'm um, actually doing math tutoring in a junior high, so I'm getting exposed to a large number of people and would be amazed if I'm not continually getting exposed to this. And I haven't gotten, I've, I've had it twice that I'm aware of and not aware that I've been exposed other times. And so, again, it may be that my immune system is up as ready as it can be, you know, on its toes, ready to deal with any virus coming in. 
Absolutely. And there is a, uh, I'll <laughs> read this comment here. Alexander says, Dr. Bean can get an Omicron booster as often as he need, <laughs> needed <laughs> at the post office <laughs> with the pens. So uh, for the newer viewers, this running joke that you're seeing, this is at my expense, of course. And there is a truth in there, which is, I went to post office, this is a few months ago. And I have, and we all have been very careful in our own ways. Somebody like the mask, they used it. Somebody like the physical distance, they did that. Whatever way we could protect ourselves, and I was doing that too. But that day, the post office um, officer, clerk, he made me go back and write this and write that and do this and do that so many times that I became very frustrated. And so finally, uh, at one of the times, he asked me to go back and do this. And I had to, uh, the, the envelope was not sealed correctly. And so in my frustration and silliness, I licked the fingers and with those fingers I was holding the pen as well from the post office and there was a long line of people and they were using these pens as well and soon after that I became sick as well so that is the story you can now use it as well <laughs> to further <laughs> this this fun all right back to Paul Thank and hopefully you, we taught everyone to stay away from the post office pens right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, unless you unless you want to get a booster, as you said, you can get a booster anytime yeah. you want to. They're free. All yeah, right. That actually so, did become a booster, and then I got another booster a few weeks ago, and this time I did not even know. So from this is this is from Tim's uh data and he's showing it up and coming down this was the prior week when i was preparing and this was the week before and so if we take a look at this um I mean, it looks like his data is shifting because here it looks like it's curving down but coming up here it looks like it's still going up straight and so he said that there's one in 15 that are infected. And uh, the week before it was one in 19. And so that was when it was increasing. And the R was 1.2 and down to 0 0.9. And he's reported the 0 0.9 continuing. And there are about 2,000 uh, people in the hospital. And the hospital and the total number of cases will actually keep going up if the number of new patients and new people going in the hospital is more than the folks that are coming out. And so if we go, if, if someone back, if we're back here is when people were coming in and now we're up at this point, even if the rate is coming down, we can still have more people being sick, get the number that are infected in the country continuing to increase and the number of people in the hospital continuing to increase. And here's his regional break, break, uh, breakdown, and you can see that we have one region that's a little different than the others, but essentially all of them across the UK are in phase. I think that's a has not been occurred before, and this is a function of how transmissible the disease is. It's just running through everybody. So, uh, Paul, did you have uh, some um, any label that said mild deaths? Jan Blackman has a question. What are mild deaths? Was there anything so. like that? A, a death okay. is a death. I, I don't know that one is more mild than another. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Sorry, please continue. Here from, from, yes, from today are the top 20 symptoms that uh, are being reported in the COVID symptom tracker. And these numbers changed by about 1% from the prior week. Runny nose going up, fatigue going up, sore throat. And so runny nose causing a sore throat, causing sneezing. And these are the symptoms that they want fo that folks can see to understand if what they have is uh, allergies or not, or if it's uh, a cold. We have brain fog down at about 30%. The ears ringing, tinnitus is about 20%. You can see all of these. 
and they're not quite the same as what the governments are reporting, but this is what they're seeing right now as we go forward. Got it. And his report, the UK stopped uh, having uh, a requirement for people to self-isolate legally. And most people say they will still self-isolate if symptoms occur, at least until they have a test that clears them. Most, probably not as many as if it was still legally required, but it's good to have freedom. And 80% have hoarded, that's my word, lateral tests so the government no longer providing them shouldn't change their accuracy in the short term because a lot of 80 percent of their people say they still have the lateral flow tests and perhaps we'll use them more judiciously and uh they'll last longer than they would if they were still being freely provided by the government and he's seen no more skin rashes than they've had before and different types of skin rashes. And he suggested that it was perhaps the XZ, a new variant circulating. And it may also be the um, BA212 coming in or something else, but they're seeing skin rashes they haven't had before. And again, if we go back to the, the list, it's not, not making the top 20, but it's something that he's noticed has occurred that they hadn't had before. And his talk said five days from first symptoms to clear the COVID is what uh, he, Tim Spector, is suggesting. Got it. And I think uh, if you look at Alicia's uh, comment here, I'll be the cool bean class experiment, unvaccinated and haven't caught COVID. I can't wrap my head around people getting COVID so many times. So thank you very much, Alicia, for pointing that out. <laughs> and secondly, yes, I think at some point we should talk about how some people have never caught it or caught it and did not know and handled it asymptomatically. It's a very good point. Um, and maybe we'll have that discussion someday. And somebody's again, gonna have a, uh, 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 an MD or a PhD or master's thesis explaining what the differences are. And there's something that we don't know is important that will end up, I mean, before they uh, knew blood types, transfusion sometimes worked and sometimes didn't, and they had no idea why. And so I wouldn't be surprised if something like that comes up. And when we were looking at the spreading, we had super spreaders and apparently, you know, a number of people have very low transmission and every now and then someone is a hundred times more transmissive. We don't know why. Yep. Here are the UK ONS standard things, infections going up, it's coming down a little now. Hospital admissions are still, you know, rising with the bump, but even without the, without the peak, they're still going up in the UK. Deaths are continuing to increase. Uh, they have 80% have gotten three vaccine doses in the UK. And they say nine out of 10 have antibodies. Well, 99% have antibodies. Essentially everybody has been exposed and the social distancing, the people that say they're social distancing continuing to drop. Wouldn't surprise me now if it's at like 25%, but it's coming down and continuing to come down. And that may be part of what's going on is they may have had the social distancing reach a point where suddenly the disease becomes a lot more transmissive because folks are that much closer than they've been before. Again, one in 13, 14, 19, or 17 people, depending on which part of the UK people are in. But it's still an awful lot of people. And you think when you go out, how many people you interact with, the chances in England of not running into someone and getting exposed is pretty much zero for any trip out. Positive test results starting to come down a little bit, but still, if you remember we were talking about 3% or 5% being where a crisis mode and they're way above that. Northern Ireland has, you know, they have an error curve. I don't know why there's no error bar in the other one, but okay. And then Wales still going up. Scotland has come down a bit and Northern Ireland coming down a little before, but they're all again, way above or above five or way above 3%. So. And, and Paul, do you also have the uh, hospitalization and deaths data as well? I, I didn't pick that up. It's pretty much the same as it's been. It's, Got it's it. going along at, at a relatively low rate. And they're saying, okay, 
we can kind of live with this, but it, it hasn't, with the last peak of infections, it hasn't really jumped up. And then it, when they're coming down, it hasn't really jumped down. It's sort of staying about the same. The U.S. had a much higher death rate and hospitalization rate for a long time, but then it came down. And so I think we're seeing essentially the same kind of thing right now in England. Got it. People have talked about the su uh, suicide rates being higher and things occurring. And if you we take a look, uh, ONS did a study on that, and this goes back to March of 2015. There's a little increase and then down, but it doesn't, it looks like they're seeing no change in the suicide rate for men, women, or for people in general. Hmm. It's the first long-term study that I've seen for overall suicide rates. And this is, this covers from uh, 2015 right. till December. Interesting. So this idea that the pandemic and there is a um, lockdowns and stresses and daily talks of the numbers, um, you feel that from this study, it seems like there is not much change. I would be happier if this data went out to today, but it doesn't. Yeah, agreed. This is 2020 December. So 21 is not covered yet in some, of course, four months of 22. But still, interesting data. Thank you for sharing this. And you can see at the very beginning, the rate seems to be decreasing for everything. And I, from the stu from what I've heard, I would have expected the rates to be increasing slightly. So, but again, it'd be really nice when they can update it and show you know the whole uh, up to the current COVID. They had an interesting study about uh, testing positive after. A number of vaccines 14 days after the last one, they're getting about half the, the testing positive rate. The first vaccine, uh, 15 to 20 days, 15 to 90 days gets much closer. 90 to 80, 180 days, more protective. Past 180 days, the error bar crosses the unity, so it's saying they're statistically showing no effect for the vaccine. And here they have Moderna broken out, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and again, after 90 days with the second Pfizer, crosses unity, but then 180 days, it comes back. So apparently between 90 and 180 days, it doesn't do anything, and then it does become statistically significant. And I can't believe with as many vaccines that are given that there isn't enough numbers to make this statistically rigorous. Yeah. If the third vaccine, 90 days after the third vaccine of any type, no effect, and 180 days, even the average is above unity. It will be really interesting to compare this data with the unvaccinated and see how they are faring in the same uh, setup and see how their infection rates are. Well, I'm assuming that's what they're comparing it to. Okay, so the, this is a comparison to unvaccinated. Now, otherwise, what, what is it they're comparing it to? I mean, that's gotta yeah. be what they're comparing it to, doesn't it? Got it. And then they had in the pre-alpha period, the alpha period, the delta period, they did not have it for the Omicron. They said they didn't have enough data for that. Hmm. So we're having the pre-alpha, this is the Wuhan variant. During alpha, it was less effective, and less of a range. So again, the personal differences didn't seem to be there. But even the high point is almost exactly the same, but the low point, came much further down. And then during the Delta, it was rated a half. And notice uh, the, the, the one third is way over here. There's no, essentially nothing in this zone. Okay, and here we have the Moderna more than 180 days, the second Moderna, but it goes all the way up to almost cross yeah. immunity. Yeah. So some more detail, but I'm not sure it's clear, but it's saying that 
where, where the, the continued jabs don't seem to be less and less effective as time goes by. And then their long COVID study, okay? This, this data is less useful than you would think because they're talking here about the people that are reporting having long COVID during this time frame. And one of the problems we have is there's someone from the Wuhan that's had it for two years and they come in. Someone from um, Omicron has just hit the 12 weeks and they report and we're comparing those two as equal and they're completely different situations. And so we're trying to see how does the Omicron compare with the Alpha or the Delta or the Wuhan, we can't really do this with the data. But the other thing that disappointed me, and maybe I just don't understand, is I have these two groupings that they said. If people with self-reported long COVID, 24% had or suspected less than 12 weeks before. Okay, so they got long COVID less than 12 weeks before they had, uh, I mean, they had COVID and then they got long COVID less than 12 weeks before, but it may be two years since they started it. And when we add the numbers up, we get 2.4 million and that doesn't correspond to anything. So I don't know where they're getting the numbers and the percentages don't add up. So it's aren't they like saying that the people who now have the symptoms, they suspect they had COVID about three months ago. So they had COVID-19 less than 12 weeks previously. So less than 12 weeks. So not three months ago, but within the last three months, they had COVID and now they have symptoms as well of the long, meaning they become long COVID. Right. But, but if, th if that were right and these added up, then when we go back, these numbers should reflect the period of time that they were, were talking about, one of these numbers, and they don't. Interesting. Because 2.4, okay, which one of these is 2.4? None of them. Mm. Can I add them, add a couple to get 2.4? No. Mm. And I can add these two and get about 2.4, but why would I pick these two? Mm. Flowers in here says that mic is great. Thank you very much. A lot of money is spent on this mic. <laughs> And then they said of these people with self-reported long COVID, 33% uh, had or suspected it before alpha became the main variant. And it was during the alpha period, it was 15% and 27% during Delta and 19% during Omicron. Well, again, trying to compare these and drawing a conclusion of alpha versus Omicron or whatever, I don't think you can do it. At least I can't because I don't know the basis that they're comparing it for. Are these people who have ever reported it? Are people still having long COVID today? And again, this adds up to 1.6 million. And if we go back to their numbers, 1.6 is an average of these two. I mean, again, it didn't make any sense to me where their numbers came from. I'm not suggesting that they didn't do their statistics right. I'm just saying I don't understand what they're representing. Mm, interesting. And you add up the percentages and you get 94%. It's like, well, you would think they would add up to 100 or 99 or 101, but 94 seems a long way off. Mm. Got it. The, the study that I had shared, and I'm going to actually do a study tomorrow as well about the long COVID. The, the study that I shared in that study what they had done was they had taken all who are suffering with symptoms at the time of their survey and they had the data from, let's say, the uh, Wuhan variant time and later times. And then what they did was they actually just provided that whole total number of folks with long COVID and then mapped to the whole population. And they said 2.7% of the population, not the cases, of the population is suffering with long COVID at that time. So that's how they reported in that study. 
Okay. And, and one of the problems in comparing it is we had a lot more people infected during Omicron than we had in Wuhan or Delta. And we also have a different time frame. So if it's been six months, we need to compare the same infectious rate and the same time frame. And so, again, I think it'll take a little stronger uh, or, or more detailed statistics to put it on a basis where you can say, are we getting more people getting long COVID with Omicron versus not? We have to sort of balance it just like we try to balance people with comorbidities. Got it. Okay, to let go. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, moving on. Not going to criticize that anymore. But again, I may have just missed it, but I, I couldn't figure it out. I was trying to draw a conclusion, which if we were seeing the same rate or a higher rate of long COVID, and I just couldn't figure out how to get there. School-aged students with long COVID was said 5% of as large as those who tested positive. So if you took the number who tested positive and assumed that was all the cases, then we would have 5% of long COVID. If we assume we only tested positive half the people, long COVID that they're reporting would be 2.5%. Assume we only got one in 10, it would be half a percent. And if we look at 11 to, to um, 16, these, the, the, we have 10%, 24%, and 16 to 18, 15 to 20%, okay? And again, this would go to the met, all, fully met the criteria for long COVID would be 10 or 15% versus the five for all school age kids. The younger kids are less, less, less long COVID, 11 to 16, 10%, 16 to 18, 15% are meeting long COVID versus how many tested positive. Again, not saying that's the right denominator, but just to be consistent. And, and uh, Paul, this data source, I actually tomorrow I'm uh, preparing a lecture for FLCCC for long COVID. This data will be very useful. So when you get a chance, if you can send me the link, thank you. <laughs> I will do this. This is the ONS report. I, I see, got it. it, so I can see it. And so if we took look at the daily life of ongoing affected by it, this other number we have again, 1% of all kids, they reported 10% of 11 to 16 and 20% essentially, 19% of 16 to 18. Say so daily life is affected by ongoing COVID-19 symptoms more than 12 weeks after, 20% of those who tested positive. And again, take your favorite number for tested positive to how many actually had the case, had the, the disease. And if we had had ongoing symptoms for 12 or more weeks with 24% and 15. So here the 11 to 16s had more of the ongoing symptoms. And it's 10% for it. And 29% had a positive test. So we had 29% of the entire population had a positive COVID test and 26%. So if your number is, you think only a third of them tested positive and you multiply this by three, we're getting pretty close to everybody. Very interesting. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> So, so these, these the long COVID rates are very significant, even if we say, oh, everybody got COVID and, you know, we only had a third of them that tested positive, then these numbers are divided by three, but we still have, you know, three to, uh, you know, 24 divided by three, that's, yeah, that's a pretty large percentage of the population that had ongoing symptoms for 12 or more weeks. Hmm. And one wonders, uh, like a number of things that we had coming out of wars, how long they will be a sequela and having people that um, have their health adversely affected as we go on. And these are 11 to 20 year olds and we have quite a long period that they could be adversely affected. Yeah, and the study that I was reading today, even after 35 weeks, 91% patients still continue to have some symptoms. But at the same time, there is a good news as well. So we are not uh, worrying the folks who are listening. There is a good news. And that is that for at least the SARS-CoV-2 long COVID, 
there seems to be a gradual reduction in symptoms and resolution. There are protocols that can help accelerate that, but there seems to be a gradual um, resolution. So it, so it seems and, like... And, and, and once someone can get back to their normal life or whatever, then things will just keep getting better even if they're not seeking treatment for it. That's, that's marvelously good news. Yeah. And a quick comment, a question from Patty Zig. Question about kids who have hepatitis. So I'm, I'm hoping that you're talking about, I'm assuming you're talking about the um, unexplained hepatitis in Scotland, UK, and US. Are they still giving gamma globulin shots for prophylaxis? I do not know because what I do not know is if they are actually trying to do prophylaxis, I think they are still trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I, I would hope that they're not just blindly throwing it at them because they know it's not, I mean, it's, it's hepatitis, but it's not the same disease. And hopefully they're not just treating it blindly. That would potentially put the, the, the people at greater risk, I would think. Here is an interesting thing. Born in the UK versus not born in the UK. And they have the case rate. You can see it was identical. Then we had the People born in the UK going higher, then they went lower, they were lower, and then they went higher, and now they're much higher. No idea what could cause that. And is the data size big enough to say this is reliable? It's or this the is... Office of National Statistics, ONS for the UK, so I'm assuming that they have essentially have a huge database. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so no, we don't know the reason, but here is some data. But it's also showing that if we're saying, uh, one of the things that we've heard from the UK is that people that are economically disadvantaged are the immigrants and the people not born in the UK. Well, if that were tr really true, you would see the rate consistently higher for the non-UK. Why is it that people outside the UK, are there some folk, remedies that are working better for folks than <laughs> okay <laughs> you, you want this this video to be taken down <laughs> no no i don't but it's just saying i i can't come up I'm with kidding, any explanation kidding. Yeah. yeah there is some reason for this gap definitely and, and something changed here and here so what happened that put the non the people not born in the UK at higher risk here and lower risk there? I mean, what changed? I don't know. You know could it be that uh, Omicron is attacking the people differently and this was Delta or something? Again, somebody can get a great PhD thesis studying that and figuring it out, I'm sure. Yep. There's a quick question from uh, Carr, 99% says, during SARS-CoV-1, doctors were prescribing antibiotics. SARS-CoV-2, it wasn't prescribed. Do you think long COVID might be pneumonia or something similar? So my answer, and then we can ask Paul as well. Uh, long COVID has this definition that you have, or someone who has long COVID, has the suspected case of COVID or contact with COVID, and then long COVID is a few weeks after the exposure or the disease, and then it is not explainable by other, for other reasons or other pathologies. So they have some kind of unexplained uh, symptoms that are occurring. Now, if it was pneumonia, it is very easily um, diagnosed or diagnosable that it is pneumonia, you can see the chest x-ray as well. So it seems to be a immune-related problem and not just pneumonia. That, that seems right. I know my brother went in and he uh, he had checks x-ray and MRI and they did said there wasn't any pneumonia or anything for him and he is experiencing long COVID. So. Yeah. And How I would be very now? surprised and disappointed if the physicians treating someone didn't run them through all of the standard things that could cause those same symptoms. Got it. So here from the Office of National Statistics are the uh, symptoms that they have, and they're doing uh, um, PCR with uh, 30, fewer than 30 of uh, the repetitions for the cycles. 
and I moved him around, but uh, no symptoms at all. You can see the rate is between about uh, 35 and 50 and seems to be coming down over time. This is going from December 20th to March 22nd. And I put them in different orders. So some of them don't have the scale and don't have the percentage, but they're all on the same scale. And they have cough, sore throat, fatigue, weakness, headache, muscle ache, fever, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, and now we're below 10%. Diarrhea and nausea. And you notice they don't have runny nose as a potential. They did not ask that question, I guess. And that was the highest one if we go back to, um, we go back to Zoe. It's runny nose, fatigue, sore throat, sneezing, headache. They're fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really tinnitus as twenty percent, and your mm -hmm. lower back pain is you know twenty five. Eye soreness, brain fog is thirty. And if we go up to the O and S here, abdominal pain. They don't have back pain at all. Muscle ache. They're about twenty five percent, and we were at twenty nine for back pain. But sore throat is going up, cough is going up, and it sounds like that's consistent with the upper respiratory and a uh, runny nose kind of thing. So there's a question from John. Uh, Dr. Bean or Paul Burke, do you know what percentage of U.S. population is unvaccinated? Well, first, you'd have to define what you mean by unvaccinated. Some people would say if you haven't gotten all the boosters that are available, some would say if you haven't gotten your second shot, you're unvaccinated. And some would say if you have gotten any vaccine, you're vaccinated. So the, the rates would be way different. But no, I don't know what the final numbers are. And it makes a difference which state you're in and which county you're in. And it is also possible that those who are vaccinated like me, but have had the vaccine for some time and the efficacy is gone, are we, have we dropped back to the unvaccinated status? Right, but you've been infected, so you should have that. And uh, that should be better protection than the uh, vaccine. Or um, yeah, I'm being facetious that um, having the vaccine and then the efficacy drops down, where do you put such folks? vaccinated, not vaccinated, need to be vaccinated. So right. that's the situation as well. And the question, how long, how much does it remember? Are we talking about the two decades, 29 years? Are we talking about six months, eight months? No one's really done a good study with it. I thought the British were going to actually expose people to COVID and I thought they might uh, have some better data in how efficacy, you know, how the efficacy drops over time and, and whether it still works, uh, you know, a period of time later. There was an early study with the uh, British nurses uh, that talked about stuff, but I haven't seen anything about that study in a, quite a time. Got it. And just a quick update for uh, the comment, the question. So our world in data, I have it open here on the other monitor. It says, uh, as of April 19. At least one dose for U.S. population, 78% population is vaccinated, fully vaccinated. And again, I have no idea what they're, I, I would suspect fully vaccinated will mean two doses of uh, Pfizer or Moderna and one dose of Johnson Johnson. That is 66.5% and booster given is 30.2%. Right. And the, the, I understand that the U.S. is reporting it based on total population where the U.K. was reporting it on people who were eligible for a vaccine. So the U.S. rates are lower than the British rates just because of the way the numbers are reported. Got it. Now, <clears throat> we're talking here we have uh, I've got the site up here for the U.K. Th this shows the percent that we have coming in and how each of the variants have kind of taken over, okay? And so we have this, which is other, and then we have the alpha, and this is for the UK, then we have the delta, and you notice we now have Omicron coming in, but they didn't show it the same way. So 
I flipped it over. This is this is what it would look like if they had the same shape curve for Omicron as they had for the beginning of the alpha and the delta. But they apparently don't believe that they aren't treating Omicron the same way. And this is backwards, but it's coming up. I just took this image and flipped it over. So again, it's going the other way, but this curve is coming up essentially the same kind of way, but flattening off a little bit. You know, it's coming in and seems to be flattening off more than the Delta was. Not coming Got in as, as, as quickly. But again, it's, it's, see, we only have this little bit left, same space up here. And so if it's one of these dots, we're sort of at this point of the curve. And in this curve, it would be here. So essentially, we're having we're having Omicron taking over completely, but Omicron isn't just one variant, and just like Delta and Alpha weren't just one variant. Then we have <clears throat> the Omicron variant prevalence that we have, the percentage of the population that has it is at 7% have the BA2. And down here, we have the um, BA1 which is 0.6, and it looks like it's come level and it's staying flat, that it's not continuing to go away. So there must be something with the BA1. There must be some people that are more infectious with BA1, and the BA2 is not out-competing for some of these people. Otherwise, these this curve wouldn't be flattening out. It would come all the way down to zero. Yeah, just like Delta or the others are gone, this should have gone as well, but it is just sticking there. Maybe it has become more human friendly and that is why it is now living with us. And it could also be that there are people who have some other infection that is with them that is protecting the BA or making BA1 uh, a better competitor for BA2 or making BA2 less aggressive for whatever. I mean, there may be some phages that are attacking the... Um, the BA2 that don't attack BA1 or something is going on. Again, lots of things for people to study later on. Yeah, interesting. Now, people have talked about leading indicators, and this is the wastewater from the BioBot. And BioBot does not cover much of the U.S. at all. And the blue line above is the BioBot indication of the, of the disease, and they put it one over. And these are, uh, on this end, it's copies per milliliter of sewage. And on this end, it is daily new cases. And so this is just an arbitrary scale. I could make it 10 times higher or one-tenth or whatever. So there's really no significance in how high they are. But they tried, I think, on this July uh, 20, 20th date to get them the same. You can see that it, the indication here was there was about to be a big spike and there was not much in the cases going on. Here they tended to correlate pretty well. Here again, we have the wastewater data showing that there should have been a much higher peak than there actually was. You see the reporting changed and we're not doing weekends anymore, I guess is what this is. And we had the decrease here, they didn't show anything. This bump up, there wasn't anything. We had it coming up and coming down like this. Keep in mind what this curve looks like. You'll see it again later. And then we have this one. And if it's a leading indicator, the curves shouldn't overlap. So something is happening there. And a number of people are excited because uh, if we take a look at the, the end right here, which I've blown up to make it easier to see, it's the wastewater is showing we're getting an increase and the rates are staying low. And you look here, it showed an increase in the rate stayed low and the increase wasn't real. And here where they went out, where they started up, it wasn't so much leading. And even here, this curve would be much flatter if it followed the same. So I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that this wastewater indication is not accurate of what's going on. They don't have all that many uh, places covered in the U.S. Ge geographies. There's a reason to suspect that this might be good, but 
the correlation that we have, the experience over here, doesn't cause me to believe that just because this is coming up that we necessarily are going to have the U.S. case rate follow it. Interesting. Any questions or comments on that? Let's see. There is a question from Matthew. He says, how is this diagnosis being performed? They're taking this and they're running the PCR test on water. And let me see. And so they are not looking at viable, uh, they're looking at just the genetic material. And so. There is a question from OK to let go. I've missed something. Partners, second JNJ was 11321, circulating antibodies all waned now, just relying on memory cells. But he has a white blood cell cancer. He's very careful, but still. Yeah, so this is something which. Um, which need to be seen um, in terms of efficacy. We continue to see that three, four, four months later, efficacy starts dropping. But is the protection still for the hospitalization or the severe disease or death? Is that still there? So that these are the kind of things to look at. Right. And you also need to talk with the doctor about the fact you got leukemia, whether that makes a difference in the memory cells or whatever. I don't think anyone really understands how well the two interact. Yeah. And Rima says, but could the virus genetic material have changed? So I think that for Omicrons, these are changing compared to before. And within Omicron, there are subspecies that are coming in as well. If Rima, you're asking that. And I want to thank Rima for a great lead-in because my next slide is actually talking about the change. <laughs> so Rima knew it. Rima does a great job. Good straight man. <clears throat> so here we have, if we, I, I only put in the 12K for the Omicron. This is the, the BA1. And we get 27.5 substitutions per year is the rate. Okay, if I put in just the BA2, I go to 34.7. Now, first let me say, there's two different databases you can use. You can get slightly different numbers depending on whether you're using the open source or not. And so um, I picked it, but just to show the difference, if we look at the BA1 from zero up and just the BA1, the their program estimates 27 and a half substitutions per year. If we just look at where the BA2 is, it's 34, seven higher. That's, uh, you know, about a third higher. We put them both in, we end up with a number in between 29, okay, or 30. If we go to the prior presentation when I talked about it, remember this 39, 30, 34, and, and 27. We go to the prior one, we we're getting 28 if we looked at the BA1 and BA2. So 28 has gone up to 29.8. So in the last, since I last talked about this, just the looking at the BA1 and the BA2, we're getting much higher rates of Substitution, if they just continued at the same rate, we would have the same slope of 28.8. And we've gone to 29.8. Interesting. 3% increase in about two weeks in terms of the, the overall uh, data rate, because this includes all of the historical. If we just looked at the new ones, it would be a much higher rate. If we look at our prior presentation, if you remember, we had the rate, and I said, if we ignored the BA1 and BA2, we'd have this yellow, which was about 90% of what the other one was, and this one was 25, is what they said the average was. And again, we're at 28, 29, and um, so this one was 23, 
the purple, if we say it diverged from the line that we had before, at this point going up, we would have a 43 increase. We say it so diverged. The mutation is that. increasing per year. Yeah. And if we're saying it diverged from the, the, the line that they had at this point, trying to draw it through a rough line, it would be 32 per year. And we just took the slope that it was before BA1 and BA2 and slid it over, saying there was a one-time increase in number of substitutions. And after that, it continued at the rate that it was before, we would have this blue line. Got it. And if I put these same lines on top of where it is now, you can see um, there's an underestimate what's going on. None of these estimates that I had last time captured the rate of variation that we're seeing today. The other thing that doesn't make sense to me is see this white space between the BA1 and the BA2? If I go back to my prior slide, these numbers, these are right on top of one another. There isn't the space. Their data is changing. The data that they're reporting for January 22 changed from when I captured it before and where it is now. There's a huge Maybe difference. that they're receiving more and more sequences, and then as they receive the sequences, data is becoming refined. But this data point, they're saying there's more substitutions than there were before. These red points were down here. See, this is 70. If I go back, yeah. I had 70 here, and the red were below the 70. Hmm. The data taken on January 2nd was below the, the below that. And now, apparently, they went back and found there were more substitutions in the old data. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. But regardless, my estimates were wrong. I, I said that these might be the rates that we were going to see in the future, and they're all way low. And as you've been saying, it, it, Omicron may be, or coronavirus, whether you call it Omicron or they call it something else, is mutating to get closer to us. The mutation rate is going up and up, and the virulence or the, the, the suffering doesn't seem to be getting higher, but the infection seems to be getting higher, so it is getting more adjusted to us. And so more substitutions seem like a pretty good idea, and we're getting that. Now, we have another new variant that's out there that's captured some attention. And this is from the New York Department of Health. There's a BA212 and a BA212-1. And they say it accounts for 80% of New York cases. Well, first, you have to be careful what they're saying. They mean 80% of the new cases, not 80% of the total cases. Because there's some people that have had it for two weeks or four weeks or a week, and they're not the BA12 or BA12-1. And 90% of the new cases in April in central New York are from this BA12 and BA12.1. They, but Someone calculated that it's a 23 to 27% growth advantage. And so my question, before we heard that Omicron was getting close to as infectious as measles, has it crossed over? Has it not crossed over? We'll answer that question and not that it matters and measles may be more infectious with certain conditions, and Omicron may be more infectious than others, and Alpha may be more infectious with other sorts of exposures. So there, there probably isn't a single answer to that, but that's the question I had. Are, are we now dealing with something that is the most infectious, common infection that we've ever seen? It isn't there. It's close, but we'll address that in just a little while. This is a terrible slide, but this is the one that the New York Department of Health says. This line right here that you can barely see that's the red line, this is their rate of number of infections, okay? And they're superimposing it so you can see where the change in the variance occurs versus the infections. And here is their key. We have BA1, we have BA2, we have BA11, and we have other. And other is probably the BA12 one, but they didn't label it that way for this slide when it first came out. 
So you can see that we're getting a very, very quick increase here. And it looks like the second week here was a much faster increase than we got with the BA2 coming in. But the third week looks like it's kind of sort of caught up. So this shows they, they, they still say there's 7% BA1 and 80% BA2, and this 11% could be BA212. Um, yeah. Quick uh, questions, comments. So Texas Max says, so my question is, when do we have it as a SARS-CoV-3? So for me, Omicron was SARS-CoV-3. The behavior is different. The pathology is different. Management in the severe cases is the same, but symptoms are very different. The transmission is very different. It is still the same species, but we have the others as well, like SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus too. Well, and we're also so seeing I, where, like F FLCCC is suggesting different treatments regimes for correct. slightly different. And so we're yeah. talking about people switching off some of the drugs and the amount. And so it would seem to me from what little I understand from a medical standpoint, it already is there, but I can understand the politicians not wanting to say, oh, I've got a new pandemic on my watch. Correct, correct. This is COVID-21. And uh, Rima's question, do we have data from Omicron on long haulers? I yes. think we have less data yet for the longer term, like seven months, eight months, as we have for the others. But yes, Paul. Yes, some of the data I was talking about before from the Brit Britain was talking about Omicron during the long hauling, but we don't have a long enough time frame to really compare it well. But what is clear is the data does not show that there is a crisis in long hauling from Omicron. Maybe it's less, maybe it's about the same, but it's not dramatically different or we, we we don't see it yet in the data but it's difficult to understand their data and i couldn't I, I didn't understand it the way they were trying to present it and maybe i'm just not very enlightened but um it, it didn't come together as, as the data from the office of national statistics usually does with with the uk i usually say yeah that's exactly what they're meaning and what they're saying and in this case i was i was lost got it here is a different thing from the Department of Health, and they're just showing the BA2, and this goes to April 9th, and this one is April 9th. And so this one is showing that they have 11% other, and this one is showing they have no percent other. Which one is right? Oh, excuse me, this, this is region two. This, I'm sorry, this is CDC region two that includes New York. And we go back here, this is New York Department of Health. So the 11% in the Department of Health, if we look at the region, becomes nothing. So apparently the, the New York cases aren't enough to impact the whole region. And so region two is not seeing the same increase for BA 12, one and two that New York City is seeing. So it appears to be limited just to that political division in New York. Rima says, my tinnitus is back with a vengeance. I want to weep. I'm so sorry, Rima. You, you've got our prayers and we'll continue to pray for you. I'm glad you got a, a, a respite from that, even if it does come back. Yeah. And Meeple Art says, would FLCCC have a handle on data on long haul from Omicron? So Meeple Art, I am actually working on the um, FLCCC's updates on the long haulers. So I have some data, I'll use that. Tomorrow I wanna to discuss the symptoms and what kind of symptoms are more prevalent in long haulers in the previous variants. And then we'll discuss the long, uh, Omicron as well in another discussion, maybe next week. Okay, this evening before I came on, I went and I did a Google or a internet search. I guess I shouldn't say a Google search, but an internet search looking for BA 212 and 2121. And this is what I found. There's a company called Fast Company. Don't know anything about them. They said NBC says 23 to 27% more transmissible, obviously just reflecting someone what we saw before than BA22. 19% of new cases in the US. New Jersey, New York, they're saying it's 52%. 
Now, if that 52% is right, I still don't understand why the um, region doesn't show anything. If it's 52% of the cases for New York and New Jersey, it should show up here. So again, I think we're having inconsistent information. In, New, in uh, New England, they're saying it's 20% overall. On the West Coast, which they're just counting as uh, California, um, um, Washington is 8%. South Central, Texas and whatever is 1.6. The South is like um, they said was uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, no, 19% and the Southeast, I guess, was North and South Carolina was 23%. So we're seeing a way, a hugely different reported impact of the BA212 than what we saw before. But again, if it's 52% here or uh, for New York, New Jersey, and I go back to their incident rate, it doesn't look like it's come up very much at all. If this is really 50%. You would think this curve would jump way up. So again, it's looking to me like the numbers that we're getting in the popular press aren't really corresponding to the numbers that the uh, health people are reporting. Very interesting. The Boston Herald says 20% of the new regional cases are these two variants, and a week ago it was 11%. New York as they say, New York said it was 23 to 27% more transmissions. Mm, exactly the same number. We're, so we have one estimate, they're just getting repeated. We, we, this is not, you see it in a lot of places, but it's, I, I don't think it's different people have come to the same conclusion. I think it's one person made an estimate and everyone's just parroting the same thing. And they did say in the Boston Herald that so far it's not more virulent. And I'm assuming that that is coming from the physicians that are treating cases in the Boston area. And they said that their, their, their COVID cases were down, but now are increasing a bit. And DCTV said the CDC says that BA2 and BA2.12.1 represent 93% of the new cases in the US. Oh, okay. We had BA2 that was huge. And so, all right. BA2.12.1 is now 19% of U.S. cases, up from 11% the prior week and 7% the week before. But if that's right, then how can the Fast Company said it's 1.6%? And how can it be 20? Anyway, the numbers just don't look like they're adding up completely. But this is it does look like it's occurring across the board and we're just catching up with how to report it. And they reflected in the NBC News report on transmissibility, which was 23 to 27%. And they cited that uh, New York City is saying it's about 25% faster, which sounds like someone looked at 23 to 27 and said a single number would be 25. CNN says BA2 was down almost 7% in the last week, and it's down to now 74%. And they did put vaccination and infection on an equal basis. And they did cite long COVID as a risk for getting the infection. I was very surprised to see that they put vaccination and infection as equal protection. I think that's a good improvement of what they're communicating to people. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment when I respond to Matthew. So Matthew says, I like to know how something that requires a Q-tip extracted PCR can be detected in wastewater. So, uh, Matthew, the PCR is is the process and the chemicals and the process of uh, detecting the antigen. What we extract from the nose is the antigen or the throat. So, I know that this question you're asking in context of the wastewater. In the wastewater, we, when become infected with COVID, we can actually shed the virus RNA in the in the waste. And that waste, if picked up and used on the same test where we pick the, uh, where, where we place the nasal uh, material, if you put the fecal material as well, of course, the tests are slightly more different in terms of their material and the sizes and everything. But anyways, 
if you put that in the PCR, that would also give you a positive result or not based on if the wastewater has the virus. I, mean, I haven't run it, but I, my bet is you take the Q-tip with the stuff on it, you rinse it a certain way, you get a fluid, you dilute it a certain way, and you put the fluid in, and they just get a fluid from the wastewater, or, um, and they prepare it and, and run an analysis. And if we go back to the graph that they had, where was the graph? Oh, it was... You see, this isn't is saying the viral copies per milliliter of sewage. So they they took you know like a tenth of a milliliter, a hundredth of a milliliter, and just ran the PCR test until they found out how many copies of the virus they had. So so again, they're, they're, this isn't done the same way that you would do a, a sample from a person, but the, and that, the equipment that does the actual analysis is probably identical. Rima says, what is LC? So LC is the long COVID. Okay, now the question we had before, Omicron versus measles, where is it going? And we have here uh, an article from the uh, uh, newyork1.com that quoted a doctor, David Reich, who's the president of Mount Sinai Hospital in Mount Sinai, Queens. And he said, talking about the new Omicron, the then new Omicron variant, this is in December of 2021, appears to be as transmissible as diseases like measles. So he's saying they're roughly the same back in December, and that was the first Omicron. And then we had the BA2, and now the BA12-1. And if they're like 30% more infectious each time, if he was halfway right, it's now the most infectious disease that's past measles. There's an article about Scientific American we have here that reports measles affects one, one person can infect 15 people in 12 days. And they were talking about BA1. It just, and it says one person affects six in four days, 26 in eight days, and 216 in 12 days. So if you compare the 15 to 216, they're saying BA1 was much more infectious or whatever conditions they were looking at than measles was. And if we have BA2 is 20% more infectious and BA12, 2, 12, and 1 are 25% more, we have a very, very infectious uh, thing. And did you want to talk about the Scientific American article? Sure. So I can very quickly, I know that uh, I'm sensitive to the time as well, 7.33. So let me just very quickly discuss this uh, so credit back to paul that he shared this link so here it is this is an article about the omicron and that is what paul was mentioning and they are saying over here omicron suddenly arrived this past winter so you saw the data let me go to the background to the data so american society for microbiology they have a very good article let me actually share this link here in the chat because this link is not in the description if you go and uh, kind of go to the bottom of this uh, one let me just read a few excerpts for you from this one so number one researchers from the university of hong kong and we have done this discussion when omicron came in that the omicron multiplied 70 times more more in the bronchial tree compared to the others so that was one clue that it was more uh, infectious as well. But they said it did not multiply as strongly in the lower, deeper lung tissues, which was a better thing. Then here, the estimated hazard ratio for reinfection versus primary infection to be 2.39 fold higher during a wave of suspected Omicron outbreak. Omicron is also spreading rapidly in areas such as Denmark, Denmark and UK. And so we, we have seen those. The basic reason, and, and before I go there, this was also an interesting one, that an investigation of previously identified viral targets of CD8 cells, so that is the cytotoxic cells, that these cells would kill the cells that are infected, just like we talked about natural killer cells yesterday, the same mechanism, revealed that Omicron has not evolved 
extensive T cell escape mutation. So T cells are still able to catch Omicron because the evolution in the Omicron or mutations have not escaped it from there. It may have helped it escape from the antibodies or vaccines, but not from T cells. So that's a good news. And then Omicron has about 50 mutations. 30 of these occur on the S gene, spike gene. And then here, these red ones are of interest. So number one, receptor binding domain of the spike protein. That is where the spike protein binds with the ACE2. Spike is 1273 amino acids. And if I read this, it's comprised of amino acids. So the changes on the receptor binding domain for Omicron is comprised of amino acids 319, 541, and is the site of 15 of Omicron's 30S gene mutations. So that is the, the size of the RBD is on 319 to 541 amino acids. And within that part, there are 30S gene mutations. Included in the list is a trio of mutations. Let me make it a little bigger. So included in the list is a trio of mutations that have raised alarm bells in the other variants of concerns. A lysine to aspargine substitution at position 417. A glutamic acid to lysine substitution at position 484. And an aspargine to tyrosine substitute at position 501. Now this 501 is also in the New York variant as well and that gives it the capability to be more contagious. So N501Y, which Omicron has in common with alpha, beta, and gamma, is a particularly noteworthy mutation, even by itself, since it has been shown to increase binding capacity to human receptors and is linked to increased infections and transmission. So that is one technical reason. Then Omicron various possess variant possesses 11 additional receptor binding domain mutations that are under investigation. So one of these glutamine to arginine substitution at position 498 has been shown to increase ACE2 binding affinity more than thousandfold in combination with the New York variant uh, mutation. And then um, the furin cleavage site, John Snyder was just talking about that as well. So the furin cleavage site is the site where mutations can really call, cause problems because that is where the priming would occur and TMPRSS2 would go and cleave that site and separate the S1 from S2, and then S2 would go and attack the cell and fuse with it. The furin cleavage site is the junction where that separation takes place, S1 and S2. It represents another key element of SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, and mutation in this region has been linked to increase in infection and transmissibility. And of course, we have that mutation with Omicron as well. For example, alpha, delta, and omicron all possess a proline to arginine substitution at position 681, which reportedly makes the cleavage site more recognizable to the furin enzyme or TMPRSS2 like things, facilitating cleavage of additional spike proteins and making infections more efficient. efficient. Importantly, research shows that this mutation must occur on the background of additional spike mutations in order to have such effect, meaning there is a cumulative effect. The point is, Omicron is more uh, transmissible, more infectious. We are fortunate that it is not yet creating the hospitalization or deaths as it was, as the previous variants were. And again, that may be that Omicron is not that innocent, but the whole society's composition at this time and the uh, immunity in the society, the vaccinations or the previous infections or overall sort of herd immunity are making air quotations and then the variant itself. So I'll stop here, uh, Paul. Okay. So I just have a couple more slides. And, you know, where in the world is COVID right now? Um, we've got a decrease that's going on and it seems to be continuing. It's very linear. And it looks like it's, if it's gonna level off at this rate, it's got to start having an inflection point, and but it looks like it's still coming straight down. And so it looks like we're continuing to have less and less 
although these were the prior peaks that were considered quite high and it's uh, you know just getting back to those points okay so uh, um, just one quick one matthew your questions are welcome i would love to continue to help but the thing is these are the discussions i've done about 2 years ago uh again your question is welcome i'm just going to answer this question we are kind of running late as well not not more questions today uh it's not the lungs that need to be connected to colon or intestine to have the fecal matter have the virus the corona viruses are a type of enveloped viruses because they are enveloped they can usually enveloped viruses are destroyed in the stomach by the stomach acids however corona viruses can survive the stomach acids because they have spikes around them so corona viruses when they infect us they actually go to git as well and they can survive past the stomach too that is why corona viruses are called to cause are said to cause gastroenteritis as well when they cause gastroenteritis or when they go in the git they can infect git cells and then as the git cells shed which is a normal process then the corona viruses are shed in the fecal matter and they are found in the waste product so uh, i would just stop with these questions for you at this time there are more uh, explanations that i've discussed in the past it would just keep stretching our uh, discussion back to paul okay just have a few more slides here one of the questions we're asking is uh, how do we know that the data that we're getting is any good from the various countries and there's a way here that we can take a look at the shape of the curve that will show us and if we take go back here and we take a look this is from our world in data and you look at the shape right here is south korea much higher than anybody else and it's coming down and let's take a look at these others this is what australia was we have the uk and the us okay and you can see the shape of these curves coming up and you get a little hump right here which is right there and here we have the same kind of shape and so if i pull those out and put them together on the same scale you can see here is the uk the us looks like the us had some data reporting issues here but the basic shape of the curve coming down and then having an upward peak here. This is uh, Australia coming up. We have a little peak right here. We have the little, the little uh, in, income, a little indent here. It comes down, we have an inflection point and it starts curving back here. We have an inflection point right here. We take a look at South Korea we have some things here we can look and show that they they appear to follow the same general shape but they seem to have some reporting issues right here this data should have come down and come flat so they're missing some cases here we can see if if the disease is progressing the same way around the peak as it did in these other countries south korea was underreporting at this point and here was underreporting and then it came back and then we have the little hiccup on this side and so this excuse me th this is the us that did this in south korea here we're seeing they underreported cases for this time frame because it should have come down should have continued to coming down and did this and then the curve should have come flat and so these points should be connected so we have an underreporting of cases apparently right here or something else happened in the in south korea that didn't happen in the us didn't happen in australia didn't happen in the uk and so we can be fairly certain that we're the reporting that we're getting in south korea australia the us are pretty being pretty consistent and we're not having a significant loss of data being reported or we wouldn't have the same kind of shape of the curves we have some data that's missing and some data that's a little off and last uh second to last slide if we look at the germany reporting and i used an oval here the german coming up and then it should be coming down smoothly and you see we have these extra cases these extra jumped ups 
These are data reporting errors. It's not that suddenly they had a uh, you know, 5% increase in Omicron cases for this one day that then the next day was back in line. Something happened. So again, even if we have fewer testing and whatever, we can compare one set of data to another and see if it appears to be fairly consistent. And in doing that, it appears that the data we're, that we're getting reported is getting the appropriate shape for most. And again, Germany has these little issues, but overall, it looks like they're reporting cases right. But if anything, it appears that they're getting too many cases. So this could well be that they have some patients that have been on a ventilator for a long time and suddenly reported or, or you know, are, are suddenly reported as cases and they weren't put in the, the data for a while or something. I don't know, but something happened at these one, two, three, four, five, these five data points are just out of line with the rest of it. Could have had a big party, you're right. <laughs> and then I just, I left the next strain here. People asked before for how to get to the next strain in the, the form I had. And so that's it. If someone needs it and wants to look at the, the information I had, and there's one that's the GI SAID data, and there's one that's just the open data. And there's two different data sets. You get slightly different numbers, but you get essentially the same thing that I showed. The number of mutations is increasing and increasing a great deal. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. So I know that we took some time with Cool Beans, but... I can only, while you were presenting it, I could only imagine how much work you had done to pull all this data together, to make sense of it, to pull the relevant and important pieces from these news sites as well. So thank you so much for this. You're quite welcome. We're being glad to do it. And hopefully it enlightened folks. And if this isn't your cup of tea, well, I'm not talking all the time and we can come back to the other stuff uh, next time and the time after. And we're looking forward to the art class, I'm sure. I certainly am. So thank you again. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, maybe we can put our art class to the to tomorrow because we've kind of taken about two hours and we can let Cool Beans go to sleep. Um, what do you think? I think that's great. I, I like sleep and I'm ready to go. Awesome. Cool. So Cool Beans, uh, once again, our own Paul, I feel happy saying our own Paul Burke. He, uh, I love the work I, and I love the data that he's sharing. And the this seemed like he just pulled together the whole world in front of us and said, here it is. So once again, thank you very much, Paul. And Cool Beans, thank you very much for being here. Um, let's skip the second talk today. Uh, let's have a good night's sleep. I would continue. Maybe let's do the art class tomorrow. With this, please like, subscribe, and share if you would like to support this work. There are links in the description. You can become a member on Substack, or you can use PayPal, or you can buy me a coffee, or you can become a patron. And the best of all, you can become a part of drbean.com where it is a very affordable price to become a lifetime member. With this, thank you very much. And Paul, thank you very much for being here and presenting as well. You're quite welcome. Thank you for your very kind words and your uh, nice thoughts. <laughs>